Welcome everyone to another MPC privacy event hosted by the Knowledge Flow Cyber Safety Foundation. My name is Claudio Popa and I'll be moderating this event. And we have an awesome panel uh, who will be uh, uh, discussing the uh, today's uh, topic of the day, which has to do with education. And so many of these discussions have to do with corporate training and awareness and so on. But it's not so much whether training needs to be done, because I think everyone has established that, especially in the past few years with the pandemic. But how should it be done? What should it focus on? How can we make it more effective? Uh, those are the types of discussions and the kinds of questions we're going to be deliberating on today. And we've got a fantastic panel uh, with us today. Um, I, I want to introduce all of us uh, here. Uh, you already know me, but, um, uh, but we've got some a really great distribution from industry today. And, and we've got Amalia Barthel, who's the practice leader for privacy at uh, Managed Privacy Canada. We have Brent Arnold. He is a data breach coach, and he is a partner at Gowling's um, advocacy department. He does specialize in cybersecurity and commercial litigation. Um, he is also, um, uh, Brent, can you remind me, what is your role at the Internet Society? I'm a corporate sector secretary and director of the Internet Society Canada chapter. See, I could never have have uh, said all that stuff, but that's awesome. Uh, Michael Luters, um, who's the VP at um, at ProLink Insurance, and he has been advising companies for decades. He he takes on a, a consulting role as he helps organizations uh, qualify for cyber insurance. Uh, so he has extensive experience in that space. And uh, finally, we have David Krebs, who, um, uh, who's with, um, um, sorry, David, um, Miller Thompson. And so I was going to say David is in Saskatchewan because he's so far from me. And yet we do events on occasion. Um, David is a lawyer with Miller Thompson. He's a data breach coach, and he's involved on a daily basis with the types of uh, cyber incidents that we read about in the papers. You might have seen him as well as uh, uh, Brent, Michael, and Amalia on LinkedIn. If you haven't, I insist that you do so. They are great people to follow. They all share important information on a weekly basis and uh, uh, good people to know in your network. And that's why we brought them together for our panel today, where we're going to talk about security awareness. Is it, in fact, the gold standard? Or have we moved on beyond just the aspect of, you know what, check the box that we do some kind of security uh, training, check the box that we sent our employees to a website to, uh, to scroll across a number of slides in, inside a security deck, and check the box for security awareness training because maybe that's or, or hopefully that's all that our cyber insurance company is asking for. Is it enough? And I'm going to pose that question. I'll start with, with Michael, and we'll go around the table. Uh, feel free to speak up. Uh, Michael, what do you think? Is the requirement, the basic requirement for just security awareness enough? Or is the kind of security awareness training what really matters here? Yeah, and I'll answer that question in two ways. So the first way I'll answer it is, you know, um, it's become an insurability issue, meaning that insurance companies now are asking that question of whether you do security awareness training with your employees. And if the answer is no, for some today and for a growing number moving forward, the answer of no to that question would make you uninsurable. Mm -hmm. um, now, the second part of it is, is, you know, if you check the box saying, yes, you know, we do some sort of training once a year, is that in fact enough? 
Well, I would say it isn't really enough anymore. It was, but not anymore. And the reason is, is because when you just do a training of people on a once a year basis or, you know, as part of their onboarding process, when they start with your organization, it doesn't, uh, it's usually not enough for the, the best practices to become part of your uh, risk culture within an organization. People don't become unconsciously competent at a lot of the things that you're teaching them because it's not reinforced on a regular basis. And so even organizations that do training still have breaches. And that's usually the reason why is because those best practices are not reinforced on an ongoing basis. Excellent. Uh, David, I wanna go to you and say, from the types of breaches that you see on an annual basis, and you certainly see a lot, how many of those companies say that they train their staff? I would say it is very unusual now to have a situation where an organization does not do some kind of training, mm -hmm. right? Um, be it sort of an online kind of exercise at onboarding, or if it's a little bit more you know, meaningful than that, maybe it's repeated on an annual basis. Maybe there's different modules you have to go through. I think there's different flavors of it, but um, to encounter a, an organization that has zero training, who said, we've never talked about this before, is, is, is quite unusual. Now, I like what Michael was saying about the risk, sort of the cultural bit, because I think companies and organizations have to have a certain sort of compliance culture for this to be, you know, you know worth it sort of um, what, what, what it's meant to achieve. Um, if, if you don't have a culture of sort of um, compliance, or if you don't have um, senior leaders that, that kind of buy into, you know, training people and getting them to understand the law, getting them to understand the risk, mm -hmm. you can't just say, okay, now security is important. Here's this training. Um, I think it does have to be reinforced. Um, and and um, with all that, I think maybe Claudia, what you're um, getting at is we have this training. You're telling me that everybody's getting training who's suffered a breach. So what's the training actually doing, right? And I think that's where you get into the meat and the, and the heart of this. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, and there's also the element of training resistance that I've come across within organizations where it's the same package of training that's delivered to, to any number of people across a large geographical area, different offices, perhaps even different cultures in those offices. And a lot of those people will say, what well, it's not my job. Why am I even learning this? Um, it, isn't this the job of IT? Why are you telling me all this? Are you trying to dump accountability on me? Is that concept of training resistance a real thing, Brent? It absolutely is. Um, and it's part of this, I think, is there's always there has always historically been this sort of notion that you, this is IT's problem, because the way that the lay most people, their lay understanding of, of cybersecurity and privacy, all of this is essentially you just build a good wall around your castle and then nobody's going to get in. And it's not my job to police that. Um, I actually see it uh, not even so much uh, resistance, but uh, at the sort of rank and file employee level, I see it uh, more of a problem at the executive level, because very often the folks in the executive suite uh, or senior management are the ones who think they understand the problem. Mm -hmm. And so they tend to brush it off, right? They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know not to click on stuff. And then they do it anyway, because they're on their phones and they're in a hurry. So they do understand in the abstract that this is an issue. They've made sure their employees are getting the training, but they're the ones that sometimes are, are the, the ones that, and, and of course, they're also often the targets, right? If you're talking about a, uh, uh, you know, a fairly targeted attack, they're the ones that uh, the, 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 the threat actors are after. So I do see that resistance, but I think the bigger problem is maybe a bit of fatigue uh, where people think that they understand the problem. And so they let their guard down. Mm hmm yeah. Um, and there's also the matter of accountability. In many cases, you've got uh, management that goes and says, you know what, I keep reading about these breaches in the paper. Ultimately, 
the management level is accountable, the board is accountable, we need to find some ways of distributing some, some of this responsibility. And so if we can train more people across the board, then we can, first of all, pinpoint who's making the mistakes and clicking on the wrong thing. And secondly, maybe that accountability won't trickle up so quickly all the way to the board level. Amalia, I know you're a privacy expert, but you've seen this situation firsthand with boards of directors, with leadership that puts training into uh, it puts training in place, not as a formality necessarily, but as a way to deal with that problem, that problem of accountability. Yeah, so I, I want to um, pick up what David said, and also what Brent said. And I think, first of all, um, the boards are, you know, and with the recent changes in the US uh, with uh, SCC, cybersecurity, initiatives and um, in the aftermath of solar winds, there is a recognition that board members have to actually have cybersecurity knowledge and training prove mm -hmm. demonstrable. That's coming. Uh, but one of the things, and I always say that privacy is Cinderella. I do not see executives connecting privacy objectives with business objectives. They barely do that with security. How many companies have a security strategy? I mean, for real, how it's a, it's a fraction or almost close to zero that privacy is actually reaching that stratosphere. So that's one, one issue. The other issue is if there is no, there are no privacy objectives aligned with business objectives. So the business doesn't feel like something is at stake if they don't do privacy, then how can that be reflected in training? There is no link. And, and a regular employee on the ground does not understand why they're learning about that. And they don't understand the difference between privacy and security. Yeah, um, so that's a good point, especially around legislation and the fact that legislation is not a static thing. It changes around the world. It's influenced by the trends that are seen in various geographic um, and governance areas. Um, Michael, do you see changes in legislation and changes in industry standards impacting the, the ability of companies to qualify, Canadian companies in particular, but perhaps North American as well, um, the ability to qualify for cyber insurance, even though they, they check that, that box for training, for cybersecurity training? Uh, yeah, it's not a regulatory thing, but if we're talking specifically about insurability, um, yes, you know, insurance companies are always learning from, from their experience. And, and because they've been losing so much money on cyber insurance in the last few years, uh, they're all searching for that silver bullet, that one risk control that, that, or mm -hmm. maybe handful of risk controls that really needs to be in place to uh, mitigate the number of claims that they're seeing, the number of breaches that actually happen. And of course, ransomware has become an enormous focus uh, because you just got people clicking on things that they shouldn't be clicking on, despite the fact that, uh, you know, as David mentioned, you know, most organizations are doing some form of training, but the fact of the matter is the training isn't really proving to be that effective. So one of the things that I definitely see coming down the pipeline in the next 12 months is really an additional layer of risk management that insurers are going to be looking for or insisting upon beyond training, which is, do you do training and do you do monitoring on the effectiveness of your training on an ongoing basis? Are you implementing solutions that are sending phishing emails on a regular basis to your employees and notifying somebody on your uh, security team of an employee when they click on that phishing email uh, to let them know that the, in their particular case, obviously the training wasn't as effective as you'd wanted it to be. So you're going to need to address it. And Can that, say, sorry, and that and it, yeah, and that <laughs> is something that's coming down the pipeline, I would suspect in the next 12 months. Can, can I just add to that? Uh, uh, we've all been inundated with phishing emails. And um, I think, again, employees don't understand 
why, why are you bothering me with this? Nobody's showing them the consequences. And that's where privacy is. Privacy is at the end of, but this is what happens when you click on this email and that attack is successful. If, if there is no connection, no thread between the, the, the annoying phishing email and at the other end, they're going to intercept this kind of data. You're going to end up in the news. People are going to have identity theft. Um, you're going to lose a you know, percentage of the market or trust of your customers. And that consequence does not hit their business objective, their job. They don't understand why they're doing that training. To, um, to Michael's point, um, I think going forward, uh, well, at least what we've seen, what I've seen personally, is that one thing that makes a difference is um, establishing some sort of frame of reference or by example, showing what the impact is. Uh, and secondly, to Michael's point, making it measurable. Uh, we've seen uh, companies that basically just regurgitate Wikipedia pages at their employees and others that say, you know what, you need to pass a test. You need to uh, demonstrate that you're able to um, to understand these concepts and apply them as opposed to becoming uh, what is now my new favorite phrase of today, unconsciously competent. Thank you, Michael, uh, for that. So uh, what other what what else is there? Is there something some quick fix that um, you can think of, uh, Brent, that would improve the status quo as far as the effectiveness of the cybersecurity education that's being presented to staff these days? Uh, no. So let me say this instead. I don't think there's a quick fix to this. I do think that there's a you know quickly started fix on this. And this is essentially building the privacy education part of this into the training. And lest anyone on this call starts to get itchy about this, we're not saying they have to read statutes. We're not suggesting that this be given to people in a technical way that they're going to glaze over or not understand. Most privacy law worldwide is based on some fairly, very common core principles uh, that are intuitive uh, and are common across the board and inform all the legislation and all the duties. Uh, I think that you can build that understanding into your education programs. And I think that this is important because one of the things we haven't discussed on this is that we're not always talking about a cyber breach, right? You can have a privacy breach where no one is attacked. There's no bad guy. There's just a mistake because people don't understand the privacy obligations. They don't understand. One way of looking at this that I've been reading, uh, and I, I only half agree with this, but it's illustrative, I think, is to say uh, privacy is about understanding who is has access to things. Cybersecurity is uh, about controlling who, uh, who has that access. It's the how of how do you keep data out of the hands of people that shouldn't have it, whether mm -hmm. they be bad guys or people at the company who just shouldn't have access to data that they don't need access to. I mean, to give you a quick example, I saw I had a, a client uh, that was a university and an email was sent out to uh, and it was supposed to be sent out BCC to some former students. Unfortunately, uh, it went out in a way that, uh, and it depended the spreadsheet with, with information. Unfortunately, it went out to all of these people and it included uh, personally identifiable information to all of them. These are not people that are going to use this maliciously, but technically speaking, it was a reportable breach and there was no attack. It was just a silly mistake uh, by somebody that didn't realize that this is the kind of thing that has consequences. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think building that understanding into your program, into your into your, your your education and your programming gets people to at least be mindful. And there's a word we've heard too much the last few years, but I think it's the right word here. Mindful about how they handle data, how they handle information. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, David, obviously, there's a difference between an attack and a leak, but both of them can lead to breaches. What is it that we can improve about cyber education in companies that will at least chip away at some of these, um, at, at the frequency of these, so that overall it can result in, a, in, a, in an industry-wide, sector-wide, or perhaps society-wide um, decrease in the number of, of breaches that, uh, that we've been seeing. I don't know, but I mean, what, what, so <laughs> what Brent was saying, I think, so if I, I was kind of reflecting as he was talking about kind of, you know, the last 12 months in my practice, probably 
I get called at least as often when there's been sort of a quote unquote privacy breach without a an attacker, right? Where there's human carelessness, um, the use of a USB where they shouldn't have a laptop that was left at a Starbucks. And depending on who loses, you know, the, the, the individual whose laptop it is, it can be, you know, highly detrimental to the organization, resulting in, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially in, in costs to deal with this breach versus, you know what, we've lost the laptop and that's it because mm-hmm. the information on it wasn't, wasn't a big problem. So I think it leads me back to um, the, 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 uh, the training and that it needs to be a bit targeted and it needs to be maybe not just a bit, it needs to be highly targeted depending on the individuals that you're trying to train. So, and this is, this is trite to say, but your HR personnel, obviously, if you're not training them at a different level, then you know somebody in your marketing department, uh, then 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 you've lost something because there's there's different data at stake. Now to say that your marketing department doesn't need any privacy training is of course uh, untrue as well because they might have access to lots and lots of data. It might just be of a different nature. So I think the way that we make our training and reduce the risk a little bit more or re- reducing risk through through training is to make it targeted. And also, Michael mentioned this on the monitoring, I would add enforcement. If you have training at your organization, if people aren't doing the training and nothing happens, you don't have a program in my view, right? There has to be a consequence. And Malia mentioned the, the, the consequence of the breach or so, sorry, the, uh, the, the, the harms that can the result harms. from the breach, the harms, yeah. Um, we also need to have certain, and, and probably employees are thinking, oh my goodness, what's he saying? Um, I'm not saying you have to fire everybody who's late on their training, but there should be some sort of consequence and some sort of follow-up with individuals, especially at the senior level who are not doing their training. But I want to add a bit of relief to that. Um, I think that what's happening today, and and you guys have all talked about cybersecurity, and I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that, because I think privacy awareness is not being done, period. Uh, uh, Michael talked about risk management, but privacy awareness should be done in layers, or in layers of defense. Privacy awareness is... Uh, should be done in context. That's what that's where privacy is in context. That's why you said marketing has a different context than HR. Absolutely. Um, but we have to make it part of their job, part of their how they handle personal information. So um, if if look at the our legacy banks or telecoms, like there is no way that pr- there's any kind of thought about privacy by design. So we've missed that step. But what we need to do is we need to start bringing the the practice of engineering privacy into layers of organization into, you know, you build a new system, when you tweak a system, you got to start the only way people are going to start putting their hands on this very um, airy fairy concept called privacy is if they actually work with it. And and we owe them that we we can't say, oh, we give you privacy awareness, you made a mistake. Yeah, because they don't understand it. I certainly I think one of the the issues around um, establishing some kind of a, um, an appealing or some sort of traction for privacy awareness training or or even cybersecurity training in general has been the fact that employees at all levels see abstraction they just see a lot of intangible stuff. We're talking about discussions around things that they don't really relate to because they can't touch them. Um, we, uh, we, talk about, uh, we talk about privacy in legal terms. We talk about privacy in, um, in the context of confidentiality. There's a lot of confusion there, um, but what I find is that the more of a concrete model we can help audiences build in their minds, the easier it is to to transfer those concepts to those audiences. One thing I, I tend to do when I go and speak in, at schools, for example, or in, in the educational sector, um, 
is to establish the difference between employees touching corporate data, just internal information that the organization can say that it owns, and data that the organization can say that it does not own, and it belongs to actual human beings that have uh, allowed the organization to borrow it with the uh, promise that they would take care of it. And when you think about it in those terms, um, it tends to make sense because suddenly you're handling somebody else's asset and you, you understand that's personal information and the rest is confidential information. That's one way to, to illustrate uh, these differences and to kind of make it come alive. Brent, have you found that the way that you articulate these points matters, especially when it comes to the protection of personal information? Absolutely. If people think they're just being nagged, um, then it washes over them. And it, it, again, as we, we use the word abstract, if it feels abstract to them, it washes over them. Mm -hmm. uh, the best way to explain this to people I find, and this requires some, um, some, spe um, some customization, is to lay out for them examples and consequences. Look, here's what happens if this thing that you're, if, the, if, you know, if this information that you deal with every day gets out, here's what can happen. Here are the consequences for you. Here are the consequences for the organization. Uh, if it's PII belonging to somebody else, here's what might happen to them. Um, when they understand that, most people are conscientious, good people, and they don't want to see catastrophe happen. Uh, they're also self-interested and don't want it to happen to them. So if you can lay, out, lay all that out for them and they understand, yeah, there's, because uh, I think one thing that lots of people uh, who don't appreciate, I mean, they see these headlines about cyber attacks and that sort of thing. They kind of understand, okay, that sounds bad. But I don't think what they appreciate is that when you're talking about a privacy breach, when you're dealing with compliance issues and all that, it's a bit of a butterfly effect. Eh? I mean, something that seems innocent, it seems like it doesn't feel like anything's going to you know, actually come of this. But the compliance cost of mopping that up and the reputational damage it can cause can be uh, can be all out of all proportion to the actual incident and this is something that i think isn't obvious to people that don't deal with it every day so just to back up i think that the way you have to explain this to people is to make it come alive for them by you know concrete examples involving the data they actually deal with uh and showing them how this can go wrong and there's no shortage of real world examples examples that you can show people i mean that this is not i mean you can google and find these mm -hmm. examples it's not hard mm -hmm. uh but i think that's really important but that takes a degree like i said of customization and some attention right this is why an off-the-shelf program isn't necessarily going to work for every organization because you're dealing with different kinds of data and it, it isn't going to end and maybe also for that to that point isn't and I think we talked a bit about this. It's not the same message for everyone in the organization. The guys in the shipping department aren't dealing with PII, uh, customer intake, uh, people who are in HR very much are. So, you know, you, it's not a one size fits all, even within the organization. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, Michael, you taken a, a consulting approach to, to working with clients and helping them um, find the right, the suitable um, insurance policy, when you see that an organization is sitting on a lot of personal information, do you advise them differently? Than somebody who doesn't have a lot of personal identifiable mm -hmm. information? Yeah, do you, no, do you absolutely. tell them to appreciate what they've got and make sure they, they communicate that to every last employee or just to the ones that touch it? Yeah, because their risk profile is completely different. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, and I appreciate some of the comments that have been made by the other panelists here, which is, you know, organi privacy breach is, a re is, you know, one big aspect of that, of course, is reputational risk, reputational damage. So organizations today already measure all sorts of things with respect to performance. They measure, you know, how they're doing on Google reviews. You know, they have their customer service department measured all the time on customer satisfaction. They send out surveys. They send out surveys to their employees to see how, you know, how effective they are from a customer service perspective, how effective they are as an employee in, in creating employee satisfaction. Security or managing privacy is just another key performance indicator for an organization that should be measured. And Amelia is right. Like, you know, people will do things, are more apt to do things if they understand the reasons why. Why are we doing this? Why is this important? Oh, 
I'm somehow being measured on this now. This is a key performance indicator for the company. Well, that now tells me that this is something that's really important because the organization is actually measuring it. That's the reason why the organization is sending these testing phishing emails as an example to me and why they're measuring if I click on it or not and why it's important that I don't. And it's a bad thing if I have to keep going through the re-education process because I keep making the same mistake over and over again. It's obviously important to the organization. So it's not that you want to overload organizations with KPIs, but if you are handling a large volume of personally identifiable information, as an example, then security should be a key performance indicator or your management of privacy, however you want to term it, you know, within your organization needs to be a key performance indicator that you're man managing and measuring on an ongoing basis. Audio, can I, can I absolutely yeah i was just i was just going to come to you david and and, yeah. and ask you as a breach coach from a practical perspective when you see these kinds of things uh coming in uh when you when you deal with the breach and you do a little bit of investigating and you see that the organization that was breached did have some kind of training do you then include amongst your recommendations a greater focus on uh perhaps the the quality or the how you do that personal information protection as opposed to just generally recommend that companies care about security training, do you then say, well, you know what, it's good that you're doing training, but you really should be focusing on what really matters, which is the information that belongs to other people. Um, sorry, go ahead and, 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 and yeah. mention what you were gonna mention in the first place before you get to my question. Yeah, no, and, and, and training's part of that. I think we will ask, um, you know, what training are you doing? So I'm not going to recommend training as such if they're doing training. But the next question is, how are you doing the training? Right. <laughs> and if it's just done at onboarding, that's not enough in my view. Um, mm -hmm. And then the next question is, and listen, people, sometimes people don't want to hear that. And they'll say, listen, we don't have endless time and endless money. Yes, you should train everybody face to face all the time. And then they'll understand you know, in a more meaningful way. Not every organization wants to do that. Not every organization can do that. It's not realistic. However, if to Michael's point, the risk profile is such that you're, I mean, I see this trickling down from the top all the time. If you have a CEO, CFO, you know, head of whatever that has an understanding of privacy risk and of what personal information risk is and, and, and the harms that can result, it's a totally different conversation. And so what I see sometimes in a, in a breach situation is frustration by senior leadership, mm -hmm. because once you get your, and, and I'm gonna use the, the, the attack scenario, once you get your systems back, once everybody's happy again, you know, you can do business as, as you did before, the frustration sets in when we start talking to them about notification, you know, credit monitoring, um, e-discovery of what was actually at issue. The frustration then is, why do we care? And it's, a, it's an honest frustration because certain senior leaders, they actually don't understand why we care about date of birth, email address, uh -huh. and maybe a SIN number they start understanding. But this sort of collective, um, you know, privacy is a collective sort of democratic issue, right? Rather than a, well, no criminal can take this information, go to my bank and, and, and take money from me immediately, right? If there's that immediate risk, the frustration is less. If it's, if it's a bit, if it requires a bit of a deeper understanding of what can happen in the long term, maybe one, two, three, four years down the road. Um, so that's, that's what I see. You need to break through that. There's obviously cultural differences there as well. If you have you know, an American-led versus a French or a German or a Canadian-led organization. There's obviously cultural differences um, in, in how we view privacy, but you have to break through those barriers or else the training that will follow, maybe you'll do good training for the year after a breach. And I see this all the time too. I'm sure, I'm sure uh, Brent does as well. And then you ask a couple of years down the line, so how's your privacy program? Well, we did the training three years ago and we did a lot of it. So so that's where that's where program comes in that's where privacy officer comes in and that sort of thing mm -hmm. so yeah no that's uh, fantastic um just 
moving over to Amalia, and, and I think as a as a good segue from the previous question and, and discussion, some of the frustrations that are experienced by organizations that are uh, breached and some of the challenges that are seen by organizations that are doing training or are trying to fine tune the training to their own corporate culture have to do with the specificity of that training because just saying hey you know what it's it's personal information protect it uh try to protect it as if it were your own uh, i do agree with with david that in many cases leaders um don't really understand when data becomes personal data and when personal data becomes private uh, and so those examples are one thing but the metrics that need to be put in place in order to quantify the risk are quite another. What are some of those um, actionable strategies that can be put in place in order to make the, the efforts towards privacy awareness or even security awareness measurable, but also have some sort of hope to improve year over year? Amalia, what do you see in that space? So I want to pick up um, where, where David left off, and I mm -hmm. want to say that what we need to understand is the dynamics of companies these days. People leave after a year, a year and a half, three years. So it is impossible to maintain a certain level of understanding what you need to protect when, uh, what are the requirements when you collect the data, but then how do you use it, and so on. So I'm going to go back to what I said a bit earlier. Uh, we need to educate the boards as much as we educate them about cybersecurity. That's privacy is the other side of the coin. If they only know about cybersecurity, that, that's just half. Absolutely, 100% just half. Um, we need to educate them why. We need to educate them how it's going to hit their business objectives if they don't do it. And then we need their support to embed it in layers. That is the only way it's scalable and measurable. And to Michael's point, which is, again, fantastic, it's put some KPIs. I, mean, I, I worked in big pharma over 10 years ago. I was, well, I was there 15, 17 before that. But we actually had um, measurable in our HR documentation, we had uh, key performance indicators that were linked to the company objectives. And because I was in the privacy world, my privacy objectives had to be linked to that. So measure people actionable, measure people on how they perform and conform linked to their job. So embed that into their job. And of course, then create the layers, the proper layers of, of governance controls uh, in the organization to catch uh, privacy from a, all the way from governance to to operations. Excellent. Um, so again, uh, as a segue from that to the challenges that we're seeing with, with training and the effect of training on organizations, the reason why seems to be floating around a lot. Why am I learning this? Why are we training people? Why does this matter? Why does this much data not matter, but this much data matters, et cetera. Um, Brent, how do you deal with the issue of accountability? Because ultimately people need to feel like they're responsible for something and then they perk up. Uh, how do uh, operational roles differ from management roles when it comes to the perception of responsibility and accountability? Well, nothing focuses people's attention, like said, like somebody like me or David swooping in and saying, yeah, you're going to get sued over this and you're going to have to testify and explain what you did. Uh, it's not an approach I recommend for everything and it's not a proactive approach, uh, but uh, certainly understanding consequences uh, is a big part of it. Uh, a lot of this really comes down to developing a privacy focused culture. Um, and yes, I mean, the accountability of a rank and file employee who's doing intake uh, and you know is making minimum wage and is probably going to be gone for after a year. It's going to be always a challenge to bring home to them that, look, this is, you know, you are part of an organization, that organization owes duties to people, you have, you know, we're all one team and we all have to be part of this. 
um, you, all you can really just sort of do is appeal to their better nature and also give them to understand that if you're not, <laughs> if you're not, be, I mean, to, to Amalia's part, I should be able to tell as an organization that's doing the testing, if this person is repeatedly flunking the test, I should not be putting them in a position where they're dealing with sensitive data. Uh, I'm moving them to the loading docks. Uh, so they should understand you may not get to have the job you want here if you're not taking this seriously. Um, now, as you move up through the organization, it's a different story, right? I mean, and very often I'm dealing with companies where, um, you know, they're small or mid-sized companies where the management and the people that are the, the, the uh, sitting on the board are the ones that are, you know, they, they are very personally invested in the success, the success of the business. It's their life. It's their livelihoods. And so they are easier to focus on on uh, on these problems uh bigger organizations where your directors are appointees uh you know it's a retirement gig for them it's a little harder to make them uh you know, to, to engage them in quite the same way but one of the struggles that we've had for years now and it's an ongoing one is making uh boards of directors understand that the this the buck stops with them it's not enough for them to just delegate and say we have guys that are dealing with this they need to understand them um, and increasingly, I think we're going to see courts and, and regulators, and this is part of how I bring this home to clients, is to say, look, every year that goes by, every breach that happens that ends up in a court or in front of a privacy regulator, the list of things that are expected of you gets longer, and the excuses for not knowing about these things dwindle because it's publicly, it's publicly available, right? And anyone who's paying attention or talking to their lawyers will know about these things. So it's the, like the table stakes get higher every year. Uh, so a lot of it is just bringing home to the board. It's not enough for you to be able to say, I've got a department dealing with this. I've even got a CISO dealing with this. You need to be able to talk to that person intelligently about what's happening. You need to understand, you need to be able to explain it to your fellow board members if they don't seem to be taking it seriously. Uh, so I'm fixating a bit at that level at the top, because I think that's sometimes where, um, you know, a lot of these things you have to start at the top because people lead by example, right? And you're never going to have a culture uh, that takes this seriously if you can't impress that upon the people at the top. Mm -hmm. That doesn't answer yeah. the question, but it answers a question, I'm sure. Well, it's about crystallizing the reality in the minds of, of, of people where we're talking about a reality that's changing much faster than it did 20 years ago. I mean, we're talking on an, about an annual acceleration in these types of events, and uh, breaches are certainly felt a lot in the wallets of insurance companies. So, so Michael, from the perspective of bringing this home to, um, I want to say, boards of directors or managers, etc., does the insurance sector is there a, a scenario in which there would be a breach, and upon investigation, it turns out that an organization had completely inadequate education, knowledge transfer, training from the perspective of protecting personal information or whatever sensitive assets were lost. Is there any risk there for organizations to not have their breach costs covered by their cyber policy? The only time that's going to be a problem is, you know, if you set on an application that we do training of our employees right you know on the bottom of all these applications is a warranty statement that basically says you know if you lied on any of these questions then there's the potential that there's that we're not going to respond to a claim mm -hmm. um but i would say that the it's probably less of a risk because most organizations like we've talked about do some level of training and it, and they and there's no question where they can really measure to what degree that training is really done to well it's not to say it can't be there there are tools you can use out there to measure the you know how broadly it's being done its effectiveness etc but the bigger issue comes is after you have a privacy breach you know once the breach occurs and somebody like brent or or david gets involved um then the insurance company now is going to ask all sorts of questions after the breach well how did this happen mm -hmm. why did this happen what things did you have in place to prevent this from happening? Now, all of a sudden, your organization goes under a microscope. And the problem is, is once you go under the microscope, if the insurer doesn't see all the things that they would have expected to see, we're going, well, my goodness, you handle so much private information. You have health records, you have financial information, you have whatever. And it would have been reasonable or to assume 
that you would have taken at least these minimal measures to make sure that stuff was properly protected, but you didn't. Well, now the problem is you've been labeled as a bad risk and you could be deemed uninsurable. So now the next renewal comes up and they non-renew you. But the problem is we have to disclose that information to any other insurance company that we approach and we got to tell the story. And if the problem is the story might not be a very good story to tell. And once you try and tell that story, you could become uninsurable everywhere. And that's a problem because, you know, uh, if you're a publicly traded company, you almost have to have some level of cyber insurance to meet your governance requirements. If you're a privately owned company, maybe you have investors and now the, the, the confidence of your investors are shattered in your company and you could also be in breach of contracts because cyber insurance is also one of those things that's required in a lot of contracts and agreements today. And how are you going to explain to your customers that you can't meet that requirement because you're uninsurable? And what ramification is that going to have going, well, you're uninsurable. Well, why are you uninsurable? Now all the questions start and they go, oh my goodness. Well, are you a vendor that I want to work with <laughs> if you're uninsurable? Um, and now that I know that you had a big loss uh, or you know a big incident that happened. So it's just kind of a cascading list of problems that really occurs. But you know, just to kind of go back a little bit to a previous point about, well, how do you make this important to an organization? You know, to they really, so that they really understand the importance of this. I, I think one of the things a lot of organizations don't do, which is probably something that Amelia does, is you got to quantify the risk. You know, and that's a really important thing to explain to the employees as well. I say, listen, if we have a privacy breach, that's this is reputational loss, you know, to our organization. This is what it could cost in sales. This is what could it cost in market cap if we're um, a publicly traded company. We could lose you know, a couple of our large customers, this is going to mean layoffs, this could mean all these sorts of things. Like, this is the reality. If, if, if an event like this happens, this is the reality, quantify it in dollars. And then people start to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And they go, okay, you're just not adding another training for the sake of training. Now I'm understanding why it's important. Just, you know, because people intuitively understand, well, why are you measuring my customer service you know, score with, with customers. Well, cause I intuitively know that if I have unhappy customers, we, we lose customers. Mm -hmm. so I can, I can put the two things together. So I think for employees, you kind of have some privacy. You got to put the two things together as well. So quantifying the risk can be really valuable. Yeah. Um, I want to turn to, uh, to David, uh, because there's a, again, a segue here where I see that organizations that are lucky or unlucky enough to detect a breach. Um, and we all know that most don't, but if they've managed to detect a breach, they have to then make a decision to report it to the insurance company. Then the, the breach coach is engaged and suddenly Brent or David are on the line helping with a variety of, uh, of things. Is it foremost on your mind, David, as you're speaking with a company that's been victimized, that depending on how you carry out that coaching role, that a stigma of negligence might be um, affixed to an organization that has had um, breaches and security failures, perhaps not just once, but perhaps multiple times. As, as a breach coach, do you do you care about that or do you deal with the matter at hand or do you try to advise them on how to clean up their image as well to what extent do you help with that when in fact an organization has been proven to compromise personal information and you know that if you didn't help in a specific way this organization might be seen as uh, a company that compromises people's privacy so um it's funny because I, I try to start with empathy because I think it's one of the only crimes where immediately the gun is turned around on the organization, mm -hmm. right? If your house gets broken into, your neighbors don't say, oh my goodness, you're, you know, how could you let this happen, right? Nobody says that. If you have a privacy breach or a cybersecurity incident, you're very close to saying that. How could, how could you let this happen? So I try to start with a little bit of empathy. Now that empathy, of course, is reduced if, if, <laughs> if you know that breaches keep happening and maybe they haven't reacted to it. So um, I, I think you need to, um, 
you need to have follow-up, right? Because we always say breaches, breaches can happen. You can be a victim of a sophisticated, you know, breach. You can have, you know, we mentioned employee turnover. People will, even if you have a 99% phishing, you know, uh, email success rate, a, you know, a percent is enough. So it's how you deal with it. And then what, what can you implement? So we were talking about senior leaders. We're really begging on them today. But if you have a situation where everybody in the organization, right, we say everybody's or, um, implemented MFA, and then you realize, well, except for the CEO, because that's inconvenient for a number of reasons, or nobody's allowed to use their Yahoo account to conduct company business. Well, except for you know, um, our, our, uh, our executives, then you know that, well, okay, who's, who's taking it seriously and who isn't and, and who's the actual, you know, the, the, the actual, uh, uh, who's, who's, who's got the biggest risk profile. But I wanted to say one thing, <laughs> what Michael was to say, because I, I agree with what Michael was saying. I do want to stress the cultural aspect of it though. And I know we need to tell people about the, the, the monetary risks and what can happen and all the, you know, how it can hit a pocketbook. But I do think there's something to be said for culture and how, especially companies that deal in sensitive information or that have a lot of employees or whatever it might be to enhance their risk profile, compliance and privacy can't be seen as a buzzkill. It has to be, you know, you got to move from buzzkill to, to sort of a coolness factor. Um, when it comes to privacy. And I think that's a big cultural lift, but that has to happen, at least for some companies. Mm -hmm. uh, Amalia, what are your thoughts on, um, sorry, Brent, were you going to say something? I was just going to pile on, on on that with David and say one of the <laughs> pieces of advice I often give, because we see this all the time, and it got worse in remote deployment uh, over COVID, is if you... The, the line that IT always has to walk is if I make it inconvenient for people to do their jobs, they will find workarounds, they'll use their own devices, they will work on stuff on a home computer and email it to themselves, uh, like they, they'll, they'll find workarounds. So part of this is making sure that that's not happening, but you also have to give them the tools to do their jobs efficiently because their instinct is going to be to make their lives easier, not harder. And if all you're doing is saying no. Um, and, and rather than finding solutions to that problem, uh, you're going to have a leak. You'll, you'll be leaking like a sieve and you may or may, may or may not even know it. Exactly. Um, there's, there's a lot of gray areas in the space. And Amalia, I wanted to talk to you about this. And just as we're closing point number three here, to what extent do you think there should be tolerance when we hear that an organization that perhaps had fairly weak controls um, has been hit by a sophisticated attack. I, I, that, that word was used recently. Should there be tolerance for that? Or perhaps that, that tolerance should only happen the first time they're hit, but you know, if it happens over and over again, then maybe it's not sophistication and it points in fact to incompetence. Um, how how does that should that matter given that people's personal information has been compromised yeah so um let's it's it's good now that we can take some examples uh i i always like to talk to my students and one of the things that probably um got missed in the intro that uh, we have a program at university of toronto school of continuing studies to actually teach people to become privacy specialists and chief privacy officers and we do we talk a lot about examples and you know what is the privacy risk how what could have been done and one of my previous speakers said you know uh, you, you know the if if you get a regulator to assess you or some auditor they're going to look at how much training you've done and whatnot but uh an auditor or an, an, sorry, a regulator, if you get hit, they will look at uh, what you promised on your in your policies or in your web, uh, website uh, privacy notice or statement. And then they're gonna go inside your company and go, I need to find all of these components. And when a company has weak controls or, or weak implementation of those, maybe they have state-of-the-art policies but they have not implemented them, it's going to be uh, very easily visible and, and, um, 
um, they, they won't be able to explain those things. Um, I like to take the OPM breach. I always like to go back to that um, Office of Personnel Management. I mean, we got to look at what was at stake. I mean, how Tell us a bit they? about that one. Can you, re can you refresh our memory? Well, Office of Personnel Management is the uh, org agency in the United States that keeps evidence of all the personnel, uh, their passports, their family, like anyone that has to c come into the United States, that's where the data sits. It's there also their secret, whoever has secret of clearance or whatever you have, that's the institution. And they got hit with a massive breach. And, and you know, I don't think it was enough of like, why, why are these people in management positions? How come this went past them? Like, I, I think that we have to look at what is at stake, the kind of information. And that is, uh, has repercussions in all the countries. Because if I was a government employee that was sent to the United States on some sort of project mission, that my papers and all they know about me would be in that, in their databases. So it's the entire world's <laughs> personnel got hit at the same time. So does anyone think that what happened at the uh, OPM, um, the, the types of failures, the absence of safeguards, and the absence of uh, controls in the form of, of awareness and vigilance, um, does anyone think that that's, a, that that's a, an exception? Uh, or is that more likely to be the norm. It's just, it hasn't uh, culminated in as vast a breach. Brent, you were gonna add I, your two cents. I, I, a breach as catastrophic, as catastrophic and inexplicable as that one? No, we've mm -hmm. seen a bunch of them and we've seen some in Canada. Uh, the difference between that one and some of the ones we've seen against our own government is that we don't have spies posted at foreign embassies whose cover was blown by any of those breaches, which is the scenario you have in the case that Amalia is talking about. Mm -hmm. So, yep. but no, we've had um, we've had attacks by uh, China on uh, government agencies that sit on a lot of intellectual property that's being developed. Uh, we've had attacks on CRA, uh, and no, we see this regularly. And I'm not frankly confident that any organization in the country is entirely set up uh, well enough to repel, let's say, like a really, uh, a really determined uh, state-sponsored attack. Uh, no. So uh, yeah, my, my worry is that it's the norm rather than the exception. And it's mm -hmm. just a question of who's next. Not to fear monger or anything. <laughs> so speaking of who's next, uh, we've got one minute for each of you to give us uh, up to one minute. Uh, summary of what you think is the one thing that organizations can do to improve their training, awareness, uh, vigilance, um, reporting, and, and really the, the empowerment of employees when it comes to the protection of personal information. Um, David. So um, you asked for one thing. Not sure I'll, I'll or, or just a one minute uh, yeah, stream of so, consciousness. <laughs> so I would say, um, and I think we've mentioned this word before, but training has to be meaningful and it can't just be when we're talking about um, protecting personal information, protecting the business, it cannot just be focused on cybersecurity. It can't just be a training about phishing. It has to be more meaningful than that. It has to get into what is personal information? Why do we care? Why do we care about personal information that might be public already? It's, it's that kind of thing that we need to, um, that, that um, privacy training or cybersecurity training needs, needs to address. And it has to be, uh, organizationally, there has to be a culture that starts, you know, we always say, um, lead from the top, the mood in the middle, uh, middle management ha has to champion that as well um, in order for the training to be to be meaningful and then you need a program around it I think that's that's where organizations should strive to go it's not easy but that should that should be the goal Michael yeah so I, I think what it really comes down to if you want to create the right culture within your organization around this is, you have to identify it as a priority from the top. Then you have to take action 
which is your training, and then you have to measure. And that's really what's important because if you don't measure it, it can't be important. Nobody's gonna, and when you measure it, you're, you're, the message you're sending to everybody is that it's important. And when you measure it, you can also create accountability. And that's what also is really important within an organization. Is that there has to be an accountability created at all levels around this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And once you do this and it gets implemented and it's done well on a regular basis, it just becomes part of your culture. It just becomes one of those things that people do. It's kind of like, you know, you know, prior to having, you know, fobs and all these sorts of things, you know, the last person out of the office just knew they had to lock the door. <laughs> you know, you didn't have to tell people that it was just intuitive that they knew that. Um, and that's kind of a silly example and a simple example, perhaps, but that's what I'm really trying to get at is that that's what I mean by unconsciously competent. People will just naturally do the right things. They want to, people want to do the right things. They just don't know. They just don't know what it is and they don't know why it's important unless you tell them. Mm -hmm. That's right. Brent? Yeah, I, at the risk of just piling on, I mean, I'll throw in a cliche to go with it. Uh, they say culture eats strategy for breakfast, and this is an area where that's absolutely the case, because uh, if you don't have that, then you have incident response plans gathering dust, and you have policies that people don't read. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of this is uh, looking hard at the culture of your organization and just sort of baking it right into, I'm going to mix metaphors here, baking it right into the DNA of the organization so that it just becomes what people do. Uh, it, it, it doesn't become an obstacle or something that they have to deal with uh, on, a, on an occasional basis. And really everything has to stem from that. Uh, some organizations, I think that's easier uh, because they understand the nature of their organization as they deal with information of a particular kind, health organizations, that sort of thing. Uh, others uh, that are more commercially bent, it's more, of a, uh, it's more of a struggle, but you have to figure out a way to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. Amalia, you've got the last word. Very, very quickly. I keep trying to tell our clients, let's do simulation exercises. Let's scare people. Let's wake them up one morning and say, this happened. Um, let's uh, make them understand the consequences. What are they going to miss? I, when I talk to my students, I always say, we got to look in the eye of the senior VP and say, uh, you're not going to have a gift under the Christmas tree this year because you're not getting that bonus, you know? So I think it needs to hit home for people. You've created this breach. We're part of it. Guess what? We're going we're gonna to have to fire 15 people, not because they've done something wrong. We just took a big hit. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. I, um, I love it. I, I think this, this has been fantastic. Thank you very much everyone. Um, your insights are going to be invaluable to everyone who watches this. Um, you're all going to uh, be able to uh, point to today's event as the um, as as a great panel discussion for one, but also as the uh, the way that this type of thing should be approached within organizations in um, uh, and you've all said it in, in different ways. Uh, you've all said, understand what the challenge is and create a training and awareness program that arrives at vigilance by understanding company culture and by understanding the types of assets that are being protected. So uh, with that, thank you very much. I want to um, to remind people that we're going to have another of these uh, events just before taking a break for the summer on June the 2nd. And everyone will, uh, will uh, be notified of this if you're on our mailing list. Um, and we'll see you on June the 2nd. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. And thanks to everyone who attended in the audience. Thank you. Have a great